Hello, my friends. How's it going? Welcome to another episode of D&D Optimized, part of the D4 Network. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. And we try to create a character not necessarily that's the best way to build it or the right way to build it, but we explore one option of how to build a particular character in a way that is both really fun to play in game, but also really powerful. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the game itself, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I am really happy that you're here. So thanks for being here. My name's Colby, and I'll be your host. Before we jump in to the episode today, um, let me just throw out a quick reminder that if you like the content or think you might like it, um, that would be awesome if you would click the like button down there in the corner. And even maybe more importantly, consider subscribing to the channel because I like subscribers and I think you would enjoy subscribing. <laughs> anyway, many months ago, I did a short for me, which was really like 30 minutes long video on why using two weapons in combat in D&D as a martial character is inferior to either ranged attacks or two-handed heavy weapons in D&D, at least from a mechanics perspective. If you want to see that video, it's right there. And ever since that date, I have wanted, of course, to do a build that focuses on using two weapons in combat. <laughs> because as you guys probably know, sometimes on this channel, I like to say, for example, take a subclass and try to make like the best character I think that I can out of using primarily that subclass, right? But then other times the weekly build is motivated by more of a theme or a concept for a character. If I'm going to play a martial character in game, speaking personally, my favorite archetype has always been the fast attacking, dexterous, flurry of blades or blows kind of character. For example, even if it didn't always make the most sense from a numbers perspective, and I know that's shocking for some of you considering that it's coming from me, I would always like dual wield lightsabers in every Star Wars video game where that was an option, rather than a single blade or even a two-handed double-bladed lightsaber. I just really love the image of a character going into a fight with two weapons, a character who is quick, agile, like a whirling blender of precision and death, as opposed to like a big, heavy-hitting brute. Personal preference, but I'm willing to bet that based on the number of requests I get to do a character that uses two weapons in combat, a lot of you find the concept similarly attractive. But there's also another request that I've had a lot of over the months, and it is to build an Eldritch Knight fighter. Now, I've dipped into Eldritch Knight in the past, but I've never really given an Eldritch Knight like a build of their own. And I've been meaning to do so for a very long time. Because who doesn't love the concept of like a spell sword, right? A Gish character, one who wades into battle with both swords and sorcery. I do. And I know that a lot of you do as well. So, so for the build this week, I'm going to combine both of these things an Eldritch Knight who focuses on using two weapons in combat. We might take a dip into my favorite subclass along the way to bolster both our magical prowess and also for a fun little synergy trick at higher levels. But this character is slicing, they're dicing, they're dodging, they're dancing, and they are empowered by the arcane to buffet enemy attacks, hit harder, hit faster, and even throw out a control or blast spell once in a while if they need it. We're going to try to optimize them for sustained damage per round, meaning this character will be doing very solid damage per round every round without expending a lot of resources to do so. And so I proudly present episode 67, The Eldritch Blade Master. Big thanks to my friend Randall Hampton for the art that he did for this particular episode. I absolutely love it. As always, I love the tiefling. That's not something that I've seen him do before. And the, the, the outfit in particular is spot on. It's so perfect for the way that I imagined this character. He does fantastic work. If you guys are interested in following him, check out the video description for links on how to do so. All right, let's jump into the build. At level one, for our class, 
Even though we're going to be dipping into another class later, I think starting fighter makes the most sense with this build, particularly since we will be using concentration spells through most of our career, and starting with constitution saving throw proficiency is just really important for those concentration checks. So we're starting off as fighter. As for our race, I'm gonna recommend custom lineage. There is a really important feat that we want, and it's hard to beat, starting with a free feat, plus two and an ability score of our choice, plus dark vision. And then we get all of that from custom lineage, right? Go another route if you really want to, if you don't like custom lineage. I think my second best pick for a race would probably just be good old fashioned mountain dwarf for a plus two in two ability scores. We're gonna benefit a lot from a high dexterity and intelligence. I know, it's a little boring. What can I say? I like big numbers and I cannot lie. I'm so ashamed. As for the free feat that we get from going custom lineage, I'm gonna recommend that we go dual wielder. Now, this is not a feat that I recommend often. I think it kind of pales in comparison, frankly, power-wise anyway, mechanics-wise, to great weapon master and sharpshooter for those other weapon type users. And that's largely why I think two weapon fighting suffers a little bit when you make a comparison, but I do think that this is a pretty solid feat if we're going to commit to two-weapon fighting like I've said we're going to do. I really like the fact that we get both an offensive and a defensive benefit to this feat. So first, we get a plus one to our armor class when we are wielding a weapon in each hand, and that's almost as good as the plus two to AC that we'd get from using a shield, so that's nice. And by the way, for the record, this build is going to end up being really quite tanky. We're not going to really try and create a tank character per se, but being really hard to hit is fantastic for any character and especially for one who is wielding into the thick of the fight as we will be doing. Then of course with the dual wielder feat, we get to wield non-light one-handed weapons in each hand when we do two weapon fighting. So for those who don't know, if you want to make attacks with a weapon in each hand, they normally have to be light weapons, right? So things like short swords, daggers, etc. The biggest damage die you can get on a light weapon is a d6. So now with the dual wielder, they don't have to be light, though of course they do still have to be one-handed weapons. You can't go in with like two great swords or anything. So we can use, say, a long sword or a battle axe or a war hammer or a rapier in each hand, which all use a d8 for their damage. And that's not a huge damage increase, of course. We're talking one damage per round per weapon on average, but this character is being built for sustained DPR, and so the relatively minor damage increase is welcome, especially when coupled with a solid defensive boost as well. As for our ability scores, as always, I assume that we're going with the point by method, and so I'm gonna recommend going with a 15 dexterity and taking your plus two from custom lineage there, so we have a 17, then a 15 intelligence and a 14 constitution. So yes, we are building a dexterity-based fighter today, if that wasn't already apparent. Again, the image that I have in my head for this character is a quick whirling dervish of death. This means, of course, that for our equipment, we're going to want to go with the gold buy method and pick up two rapiers, as rapiers are one-handed, but they're also the only D8 weapon with the finesse property, meaning we can use them to make attacks using our dexterity modifier to hit and to damage, instead of strength. Then I would buy some scale mail armor. Scale mail is medium armor, meaning that we can only add a max of plus two to our armor class from our dexterity modifier, right? But scale mail being a 14 AC, you add two, now we're at 16 plus one from dual wielder, that puts us at a 17 AC to start off. If you would have gone studded leather instead, which is light, which lets us add our full dexterity modifier, studded leather is only a 12, plus three from our decks would only put us at a 15, 16 with dual wielder. Now, when you get your dexterity capped at 20, you would then have a plus five from your dexterity bonus. At that point with studded leather, we would be 17 plus one from the feet. But at that point, you probably wanna make the switch. On the other hand, you could pick up the medium armor master feet eventually if you wanted, and that would then give the advantage to the half plate wearer because it lets you add a total of plus three from your dexterity modifier, and you don't have disadvantage on stealth checks with that feat. It's nice to have options, know what they are. You might find a suit of magical armor that's one or the other, and it will be good to have the versatility to wear either. 
if you need to. And then as a fighter at level one, we do get the second wind feature, which gives us a 1d10 plus our fighter levels in healing. We do that as a bonus action once per short rest. A self heal on a fairly hard to hit character just makes us that much tougher to kill. So that's nice. And then we do get a fighting style. And of course, I think on this character, we've got to go with the two weapon fighting style if we want to make the best two weapon fighter that we can. So as you probably know, Typically, if you want to make an attack with a weapon in each hand, you take the attack action, you attack with one, and then as a bonus action, you attack with the other, but typically you don't get to add your ability score modifier to the damage from that bonus action attack. If you take the two weapon fighting style, you do get to add that bonus. So now both our main hand and offhand attacks get to add our dexterity bonus modifier to the damage. And right here at level one, to be honest, even though I have complained about two weapon fighting being suboptimal numbers wise in the long run, this is almost as good a level one character as we can get, I think, for sustained 100% resource free damage per round. At level two, we get action surge, of course. Um, I am not building this character with a burst or nova damage focus, but the reality is they're going to do some very strong burst damage. Thanks to action surge. Maybe when I crunch the numbers, I will tell you where they compare to other Nova builds when we do the damage report, just for fun. At level three, we get our martial archetype, our subclass, and we are, of course, going with the Eldritch Knight. Here is what we read about the Eldritch Knight. The warrior's hands, gloved in fine leather, flex over the jeweled hilts of the rapiers on his belt. Veins of gold snake up from his fingers, along his arms, shoulders, and neck. The magic visible through his sleeves and jerkin. This phantasmal filigree ends at his temples, flushing his eyes with power. They beam like molten stars captured in flesh. With incredible speed, he unsheathes the swords and hurdles toward his mark. His movements are a mystifying flurry of ducks, weaves, and dodges. His blades flickering tongues of steel, vying for purchase. Typically, at this point, I read the text from the official content when describing the subclass, but today I wanted to read from the sponsor for this week's video, Describe. So you guys know the box text that sometimes shows up in official D&D content to describe like a location or something. It's pretty good, right? I've always enjoyed hearing it read to really kind of set the scene. The only problem, in my opinion, is that there's not enough of that box text in official Wizards of the Coast content. Wouldn't it be great? if you could have that really well-written, super descriptive, mood-setting bit of writing for pretty much any scene or character or even action or even item in your game? Well, that is basically what Describe is. It's a searchable library of people, places, and things that might show up in your D&D game that you could use to help you set the scene or paint a picture for just about anything that you might want to include in your game. I actually opened up an account myself last week. I've been playing around with it for a bit, and you guys, I'm not going to lie, I seriously love this tool. I love wordsmithing myself. I don't doubt your own creative and wordsmithing skills, but Describe has several professional writers creating content and even some ex-Wizards of the Coast writers on their team, and the stuff they create is just fantastic. And it's not just for DMs either. There are plenty of things that as a player, I'd love to have like a description of a spell that I cast or like a coup de grace that I make on an enemy when my dungeon master asks me, how do you want to do this, right? Anyone can create a free account and get access to a pretty significant portion of the library that is free. But if you upgrade to a paid account, you can get access to the entire library and even submit requests to the writers for a particular scene or character. You can even get a professionally written description of your character. In fact, that bit that I just read about the Eldritch Knight, I actually submitted that request. I submitted it for a spell sword because Eldritch Knight is a copyrighted term by Wizards of the Coast, so they couldn't use that necessarily. But that description is what they came up with, and it was so good. And now it's part of their library. So cool, you can look it up. So I actually had this idea that I ran past the founder of the company who I met last week, really cool guy, of doing a little like giveaway for Describe. So here's what I wanna do. Go to describe.com slash D4. Uh, right there, and I'll put it in the video description as well, a link to it. Use that link because that's how they know that you came from me. Sign up for a free account and then make a comment in the comment section for this video. In the next 24 hours, 
that you've done so. So basically that gives you until Wednesday, November 17th at 10 a.m. After the 24 hours are up, I will randomly pick one commenter to get a free upgrade to a hero level account for one year, which normally costs $80, and basically gives you access to their entire library of thousands of descriptions, which by the way, is growing by 300 to 400 a month. I seriously love this tool. I think you guys will too. So give it a try. Let me know. Again, it's describe.com slash D4. And also, if you do decide to buy an upgraded account um, at checkout, you can put in a coupon code. Just use the code uh, D4. At checkout, you'll get 10% off your order. So anyway, give them some love. They're fantastic. And let's move on. So as an Eldritch Knight, at this level, at level three, we get the weapon bond feature. Basically, it tells us that over the course of an hour, you can magically bond with up to two weapons, perfect, and can thereafter not be disarmed from them unless you are incapacitated, and you can summon them one at a time to your hand with a bonus action, so long as they are on the same plane of existence. You know what? Even though this is mostly flavor stuff, it is really cool flavor, <laughs> I think. But also, I can honestly think of more than one time in my campaigns that this would have been a really great feature to have. Entering a noble's house and they demand that you leave your weapons at the door? No problem. Locked in a dungeon with nothing but your underwear? Hey, at least you can have your weapons once you find your way out of the cell. Pretty handy in certain situations. And then of course, as an Eldritch Knight, we also learn spells. Spells from the wizard list here, though we are pretty limited on how many and which ones we can learn. So first up, make sure that you understand that if rangers and paladins and artificers are like half casters because their spell levels and their spell slot progression proceeds at half the speed of other spell casting characters, then Eldritch Knights and arcane trickster rogues as well are kind of like one third casters, right? They progress at a third of the speed of like a full caster of a wizard, warlock, a sorcerer, bard. So Eldritch Knights don't get second level spells until level seven. And if we multi-class into a spell casting class later, spoiler alert, we take the levels in this class and divide them by three when we're trying to decide what level of spells we have access to as per the multi-class spell casting rules. For now, we get two cantrips, so pick your favorites. Nothing that we're going to use in combat yet, but then we also get three first level wizard spells, although two of them have to be from the abjuration or evocation schools of magic. Now, that's not bad. There are plenty of really good spells from those schools. Most of the blasting spells are evocation, so you could grab a magic missile or chromatic orb or something if you wanted a decent ranged spell attack, for example. If it were me, I would probably get absorb elements, which is abjuration. That would give you resistance to elemental damage as a reaction, plus a little extra damage of that elemental type that I resisted on my turn. And I think more importantly, shield. In fact, some people like to joke that Eldritch Knight is basically just a regular fighter with the shield spell. Shield as reaction gives us a plus five to our armor class until your next turn when you're hit with an attack. It's one of the best defensive spells in the game, and it's a level one. Now, as for the non-abjuration evocation school spell that you get, I think it's got to be fine familiar. You get to summon your familiar, probably should be an owl. You know, you could obviously go with something else if you're tired of owls. Maybe you could reskin it as a different bird, but the flyby feature that owls get is really strong. It lets them swoop in, take the help action, and swoop away without taking an opportunity attack. And that's primarily what we'd be using our familiar for here, at least in combat. So now you can get yourself or potentially an ally advantage on one attack per turn. Not to mention the other great utility that you get from having a pet familiar you can scout with and cast spells with a range of touch, etc, etc. Really great spell. At level 4, we get our first ability score increase or feat. We're sitting on odd numbers for both our dexterity and our intelligence right here, 17 and 15, and so I think it makes the most sense to take a plus 1 in each of those so that we can be at 18 and 16, respectively. And the dexterity bump is going to help our damage, it's going to help our armor class if and when we don light armor, it's going to help our initiative, of course, and then the intelligence is going to benefit our spell to hit and uh, spell DCs, etc plus we'll get some additional benefits from it later. So 
For those reasons, to me, it's more important to get our intelligence up than to take a half feat that would give us a plus one to our dexterity, right? At level five, we get extra attack. So now we're getting three attacks per turn, right? Two with the attack action, and then one as a bonus action with our second rapier. We're slicing and we're dicing. At level six, man, it feels good to be a fighter. We get another ability score increase for feet so soon. <sighs> Capping our decks at 20 at level six feels fantastic. So we're almost definitely in studded leather at this point, unless we've already found ourselves like some magical half plate. Studded leather is a lot easier on the budget and it doesn't impose disadvantage for stealth checks, like I've said. Plus, it's just so much more comfortable and stylish. Hmm, leather. Okay. Time for a damage report. So things are pretty straightforward for us at this point. We simply make three attacks per turn. I'm going to say that we're getting advantage on our first attack, thanks to our familiar, but each attack is made at a plus eight to hit and it does 1d8 plus five damage from our dexterity for a total of 3d8 plus 15 if everything lands. And so against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would be doing 28 damage per round on average. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class, it would be 23 damage per round. Okay, compared to other builds I've done that are focused on sustained DPR, that's not amazing, I'll admit. Here's where the criticism of two-weapon fighting becomes apparent, I think. Without that plus 10 damage per hit that the Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter builds of the world get, the damage just has a hard time being competitive. And yet, while we're close to the bottom of the list when compared to other like tier two sustained damage builds that I've done, again, check the video description, although I'm probably gonna have to split those two into three tiers soon. I was hoping to do it this week. I don't think I'm gonna have time. Anyway, that's coming soon. We're not at the very bottom when, when we do that comparison. Not only that, but again, we have a very respectable 18 armor class with access to the shield spell, which would bump us to 23 armor class when we needed it. We have a decent amount of hit points. We have some really nice additional defensive capabilities and utility capabilities thanks to our spells. And hey, if we wanted to blow action surge, we could be making five attacks in a single round for decent Nova damage too. We're talking like kind of middle of the pack tier two Nova builds by comparison. I feel pretty good. We have lots of options. We're decently tanky. We're pretty well-rounded. Not to mention sexy as hell. And from here on, things are going to get a lot better. At level seven, the arcane power that has been growing within our Eldritch Knight causes them to shift in their path. They are realizing that they could be doing even more with this magical potential that is being unlocked from within them. They may have met someone who has more to teach them about the arcane. They may have read something in a book that piques their interest. They may have simply heard a magical whisper on the wind that's urging them to focus their mind and their energy and even their body on training in a slightly different way. So whatever your reasons, we're taking wizard levels now. So as a wizard level one, we get spells, of course, and we get full access to all wizard spells now. So I would just say, pick your favorites, whichever first level spells and cantrips that were missing from your arsenal before. Just keep in mind that thanks to our six levels in Eldritch Knight, we now have second level spell slots to upcast any of those spells if we need or want to. At level one, wizards also get the arcane recovery feature, which allows us to recover a spent spell slot equal to half our wizard level rounded up once per day at the end of a short rest. I love me some spell slot recovery. At level eight, we would be a wizard level two and we get our wizard subclass, our arcane tradition. And we're going, as you may have predicted, or, well, because you saw the video thumbnail, <laughs> we're going blade singing. Hmm, feels like home. Yes, my favorite character that I've ever played in D&D was a blade singer. And yes, I usually shy away from multi-classing with blade singer because I don't want to delay the blade singer extra attack feature. And more importantly, I think higher level spells and other higher level blade singer features, but if our goal is to be the best two-weapon wielding Eldritch Knight that we can possibly be, I think this is absolutely the 
perfect class to multi-class into. One of the greatest weaknesses and even frustrations almost with Eldritch Knight is the snail-like spell level and spell slot progression. Taking wizard levels really helps that, but what's more, the Bladesinger is going to give us a really nice bump to our defensive capabilities as long as we follow the rules, and as a frontline fighter, defensive bumps are always super important. Finally, there is some really fun and fantastic synergy between these two subclasses that comes later, which we'll mention, but I don't want to spoil that just yet in case you don't know about it. So, as a blade singer, we get the blade song feature, which gives us lots of great benefits. So, as a bonus action, Proficiency bonus times per day, so three for now, four next level, should be enough to get most of us through most, if not all, of our daily combats. We can start our blade song. You close your eyes and let out a sigh, feeling the magic simmering in your veins. Energy tingles in your sword arm, floods your feet, and rollicks in your temples. You open your eyes in total clarity, the skirmish before you now a dance to which you know all the steps. With a flourish, you ready your rapier. You step, one, two, swish, clang. As others clumsily dash around you, you dodge, parry, and strike in perfect time. Thanks, Describe. So yes, we invoke our blade song, and so long as we're not wearing medium or heavy armor, check, definitely be in studded leather at this point, or wearing a shield, check, or using two hands to make a weapon attack, check, and by the way, this doesn't mean that we can't make weapon attacks with both our hands, just that we can't use both our hands to make an attack with one weapon, capiche? Then, if we do all of those things, or don't do any of those things, <laughs> we get the following benefits. A bonus to our armor class equal to our intelligence modifier. Aren't you glad you bumped it to 16? That's 21 AC now, not including any magic items. Magnifique. Plus 10 to our move speed advantage on acrobatics checks, and a bonus to our concentration checks equal to our intelligence modifier as well, giving us at this level a plus eight to our concentration checks, which means we will almost never fail them. That's going to very much come in handy starting next level especially. If you're going to be a whirling dervish of dexterous dancing death, I can't imagine a better subclass to pair yourself with than the Bladesinger. Both thematically and mechanically, it is perfection. But at level 9, we're a wizard 3, and this is where it gets really good. Because at wizard 3, we get second level spells. And that means fantastic spells like Mirror Image for added survivability and Misty Step for better movement, but the most important spell for us, you guys know where I'm going with this, right? Of course you do. It's Shadowblade. I think think it's still my favorite spell in the game? Hmm. Yeah. I can't think of anything else that I love more. Now, up until this point, we haven't had a fantastic use for our concentration, at least in combat. There aren't any cantrips or first level spells that I think I'd use in combat when compared to the damage that we get just by taking the attack action and using our bonus action for weapon attacks. Now, however, the shadow blade cometh. So, as a bonus action, you weave together threads of shadow to create a sword of solidified gloom in your hand. It has the finesse property, yay, and also the light and throne properties. And on a hit, it does psychic damage. Plus, if you're in dim light or darkness, you make the attacks with advantage. So yes, going forward, as usual, I like to assume best case scenarios when I crunch numbers, so I am going to assume that we're in dim light or darkness and that we'll have advantage at least on the two attacks that we're making right now with our Shadow Blade each round. Of course, that won't always be the case. But do keep in mind that if you have your familiar that was previously giving advantage at least on one of those two attacks, even if you're not in dim light or darkness, the difference in the numbers isn't going to be huge. Now, as a second level spell, the Shadow Blade does 2d8 damage, but it scales in damage by 1d8 at third level, and then every two levels thereafter. Man, if only we had third level spell slots. Oh wait, we do. Thanks, six levels of Eldritch Knight. <laughs> so yes, as soon as we get Shadow Blade, we can upcast it to third level for 3d8 damage each swing. Now, you might have a Magic Rapier at this point that would cause you to think, Shadow Blade is not as good as you think, dude. But I have a hard time believing that most of us are going to have access to a weapon that's better than 3d8 damage per swing. Even a Flame Tongue Rapier would be slightly worse. 
And even if you did have a great magic rapier, well, you've still got that bonus action offhand weapon attack that you're making, right? Put that rapier in your other hand. And for that matter, if you're playing at a table where your DM gives you a little like flexibility with magic items, maybe you can purchase them or have select items crafted, etc. I think for this character, I would prioritize things like magic armor, uh, like a cloak of displacement, so good. Uh, a cloak of protection, a ring of protection, or of course, if you're less boring, a magic item that does something cool and fun and doesn't just improve your numbers. You know, not needing a great magic weapon is kind of a nice luxury to have. So at level nine for our damage report, then we are making two attacks with our 3d8 shadow blade, adding plus five from our dexterity to each attack. And I'm assuming advantage on both just accordingly if you find yourself in bright light. But then as a bonus action, making a rapier attack for another 1d8 plus five for a grand total of 7d8 plus 15. And against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do 49. DPR on average now, and against an enemy with a 16 armor class, it would be 43 damage per round. So that's a lot better by comparison than where we were at level six. We are now in the upper half of like T2 sustained damage dealers. As for our Nova damage capabilities, with a simple action surge, we are still comfortably in the middle of tier two compared to other Nova builds without hardly trying. And one more thing that I always like to mention with my Gish builds, right? Make sure that you don't forget that you can do more than just hit stuff. So throw out those web spells when the situation calls for it. That's why you wanted to be an Eldritch Knight and not just some boring old regular Knight, right? At level 10, we would be a Wizard 4 and we get another ability score increase or feat. I think with our dexterity capped, moving on to intelligence is our best move here um, to improve our armor class, our concentration checks, and of course, most of our spells. And then at level 11, we'd be a wizard five and we get third level spells. Let's talk about third level spells. Obviously there are some fantastic ones. Some of the most quintessential and, and powerful spells that wizards can get are found at third level. And I would say, you know, grab the usual suspects pick up fireball when you need an area of effect damage option. Uh, of course, grab counter spell, dispel magic, hypnotic pattern. But what about spells to increase our damage? In my Bladesinger 2.0 video, I guess I'll link to it there, I got and probably still get a lot of comments from people who want to contend that haste and or maybe even spirit shroud are better options for our concentration than shadow blade. The truth is they might be but it depends on what magic weapons you may or may not have access to. So sure, if you can get a flame tongue rapier, for example, then yes, using our concentration for haste is going to give us an extra attack each turn, um, not to mention the armor class bump and the extra move speed. And so at that point, you would get more mileage out of haste, both offensively and defensively, unless you are in dim light or darkness and didn't have a way to get advantage otherwise just using haste and the enemy armor class was pretty high. So again, it's important to know your options and alter your play based on the situation. This is a good thing. It, it keeps things interesting, right? As for Spirit Shroud, it's good, but it just doesn't compete with other spells, I think, at this level for concentration. It gives us an extra 1d8 per weapon attack right now, so 3d8 total, potentially, but we'd be better off with either an extra weapon attack if we've got a good magic weapon, or the much better weapon damage from Shadow Blade. We do, at this level, get 4th level spell slots now, thanks to our multi-classing, but none of our offensive concentration-based options benefit from being upcast to fourth level. Still, it's nice to have another use of Shadow Blade or Haste if we need it, or if you really want to upcast Fireball or Counterspell, etc., it's good to have the option. At level 12, we are a Wizard 6, and Blade Singers get extra attack. And for once, I'm not mad about redundancy here, because we already had extra attack, but the Blade Singer extra attack is a little better because now we're told when we take the attack action, we can replace one of those attacks with a cantrip. And so, of course, for us, that means we're going to attack and then use a cantrip that will be like Booming Blade, or I'm going to say 
green flame blade here because this build is not really doing a lot to encourage or force enemy movement so i think we're going to get more mileage out of green flame blade which tells us that as part of the spell we make a weapon attack and then we do some additional damage right now it's an additional 2d8 of damage on hit and then we can cause an enemy within five feet of the one we initially hit to take fire damage the fire damage from the green flame blade bounces essentially to another target doing also 2d8 damage plus our intelligence modifier. I've seen people talk about making yourself the target of this green flame blade extra damage and then using a reaction absorb elements to reduce that damage because the nice thing about absorb elements is that like I've mentioned on your first attack on your next turn you get to add a d6 of that damage type on your hit and you can upcast absorb elements for you know 2d6 or 3d6 or whatever i don't know if it's necessarily worth taking the damage even if you can get resistance to it in order to on the next round do a little bit additional damage you might want to you might be in a situation where you're a little bit desperate if the extra damage that you got from absorb elements didn't come on your next turn i think it would be a little more useful if it were just like your next attack but anyway it's it's an option and it's 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 a neat trick if you need it so yes, be sure that up to this point, at some point, you've grabbed the green flame blade cantrip. Up until now, we ha again, we haven't really wanted to use these cantrips because, like I've said, we're better off taking the attack action and then making two weapon attacks and then an offhand bonus action weapon attack. But now we are going to use it as our cantrip for a little bonus damage. I'm probably forever going to have to be addressing this question when it comes to Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade. Can I use either of those cantrips with Shadow Blade? Since the material component for both of those spells is a weapon that's worth at least one silver piece. I'm not gonna get too far into the weeds here. I've done it already in my Bladesinger Nova build that I did a few months ago. In a nutshell, I will just say this, based on polls that I've conducted amongst my viewers and actually others that I've read and seen online, it would appear that the vast majority of tables allow either for you to just simply use Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade with Shadow Blade. Even Jeremy Crawford said that he would allow this at his table. Or make your attack with Shadow Blade and then cast the Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade cantrip with your offhand rapier as your second cantrip attack that you can now do thanks to the Blade Singer's extra attack feature. And then make your bonus action attack with your Shadow Blade. I'm not going to get into the semantics of why this will or won't work rules as written. I'm just going to say that when I crunch the numbers, I'm assuming that you're still using Shadow Blade and getting to cast Booming Blade as well. I think only a very small percentage of tables won't allow one or the other of the above options that I've mentioned. If you want to argue about it in the comments, please feel free. I will just say also, don't forget that there are other cantrips we could be casting here as part of our attack action if we wanted to. Blade Ward comes to mind as a particularly strong option if we needed to like boost our tankiness and we're willing to forego some damage. Mind Sliver to throw like an alley-oop to an ally who is going to be casting a big spell on their turn. Uh, maybe Lightning Lure if we're just out of reach of our enemy and we don't have any more move speed left, we could cantrip Lightning Lure, bring them close to us, and then, you know, take the rest of our turn, make our attacks. Again, know your options. But level 13 is the level that I have been most excited about. Now, to be clear, I don't think that this build hinges on getting to level 13. It's totally viable and strong before now, so if you are playing a campaign that's going to end before this, as most probably do, I wouldn't change the way I've built it. But if you are one of the happy few that get to play into late game, you are super happy about level 13. So at this point, I think it's time to leave behind Bladesinger. Our Blade Master feels that they have learned the most important things from their focus on the arcane, and that the time has come to sort of shift their focus back a little more towards the martial side of their training. I know we're almost at fourth level wizard spells, to say nothing of the uber powerful fifth level wizard spells that are kind of on the horizon, but remember, our goal with this build was to create the best two weapon fighter possible and to create a character who is primarily an eldritch knight a character who uses magic primarily to enhance their martial prowess and not the other way around so we're going back to fighter and at eldritch knight level 7 we get the war magic 
feature, which tells us that when we use our action to cast a cantrip, we can make an additional weapon attack as a bonus action. Now, up until this point, that feature wouldn't have been super amazing, I don't think. We could have, say, cast Green Flame Blade as our action, cast a cantrip, right, as our action, made a weapon attack with that little extra damage, and then as a bonus action, we get another weapon attack. But that's obviously worse in most scenarios than just making three weapon attacks on our turn like we've been doing up until now. But now that we've hit Blade Singer level six, when we take the attack action, we can replace one of those attacks with a cantrip. And since we used our action to cast a cantrip, among other things, it will trigger this war magic feature. And thus, we can make a weapon attack as a bonus action that doesn't have to be from like our offhand weapon, right? If you doubt that this actually works rules as written, look it up. Jeremy Crawford ruled on this somewhat recently and said it works. Now, we were already making, of course, a weapon attack as a bonus action, but it wasn't with our Shadow Blade. It was, again, with our offhand rapier. Now we should be able to attack, Green Flame Blade cantrip attack, and then bonus action attack all with our Shadow Blade. So all three attacks with the superior damage weapon. Or, of course, if you have a really good magic weapon and you're using haste on yourself instead of Shadow Blade, all four attacks with that really great magic weapon. That is really fun. Oh yeah, and we have action surge, so potentially two more attacks with that weapon when we need it. So for a damage report at level 13, I'm assuming that you're making three attacks with your 3d8 shadow blade and that you are in dim light or darkness. We're adding plus five from our dexterity to each and 2d8 damage from green flame blade to one of them as well. That's a total of 11d8 plus 15 if everything lands. And so against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would be doing 69 damage per round on average. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it would be 64 DPR. So we are creeping up those charts. Um, right now we're kind of, we've kind of moved into the upper half of the tier two builds now, um, particularly at the average and higher enemy armor classes. And again, we have a fantastic Nova option that would put us at over 100 damage on average against most enemy armor classes at this level. Not to mention our ability to control, counterspell, do AOE damage, and our really strong survivability. We're sitting on a resting AC of 21 right now with Blade Song up, and we should almost always have the shield spell available for shield when we need it. That's the great thing about building a sustained damage character, right? Is you typically have your resources available for you when you need them. And again, that's without any kind of defensive magic items or armor. We're amazing. At level 14, we would be a fighter level eight. We get another ability score to increase our feet. So speaking of our amazing armor class, let's take it up a notch by capping our intelligence and putting it at 20. Having two capped ability scores by level 14 feels amazing. Thanks fighters. Uh, one thing to note at this level, you may have noticed that we're not actually using two weapons to attack anymore. Now, hopefully this doesn't throw off your groove too much or your concept of how this character should work in game. But yeah, that third attack per round with the Shadow Blade was just too good to pass on. Now, this doesn't mean that we should forego equipping a second weapon in our other hand and continuing to have a second weapon in our other hand. We do still get the plus one AC benefit from having that second weapon thanks to the dual wielder feat. And frankly, I kind of love the image of a blade master who uses one weapon primarily for attacks and then another primarily for defensive purposes like to parry, deflect blows, etc. Maybe that second weapon is notched, right? So that you can catch an enemy weapon in it. We're not getting much benefit from our two weapon fighting style anymore, regardless. Fortunately for us, since Tasha's Cauldron of Everything came out, we now have the Martial Versatility feature, which lets us change our fighting style anytime we gain an ability score, increase, or feat uh, from fighter levels, which we've just done. So at this point, I would suggest dropping the two weapon fighting style and picking up something else. What you replace it with is entirely up to you. If you really wanted to maximize your damage, of course, you could drop your offhand weapon, take the AC hit, and pick up the dueling fighting style so you'd get two more damage to each hit. You'd probably expect me to do that, but nah. 
I committed to two weapon fighting with this character, and I'm not changing that now. In fact, if it were me, I'd probably go the other way, doubling down on armor class by picking up the, the defense fighting style for an additional plus one to our armor class. With the intelligence bump that we just got at this level, that puts us at a resting 23 armor class with Bladesong active. Sheesh. <laughs> you know I've got a Bladesinger tank build almost already built. I'd tweak a few things, but I just need to wait long enough for all of you to forget about this video, so it seems fresh and interesting when I present it in 2022. <laughs> there are other great fighting style options though, blind fighting if you think you need it could be cool, um, interception if you really want to be a team player, or superior technique for a once per short rest battle master maneuver. I'm just going to say pick your favorite. At level 15 we would be a fighter 9 and we get indomitable. Um, so now, once per long rest, you can reroll a saving throw that you fail. That's nice. But also, important to note, we do get 5th level spell slots now, thanks to multiclassing, right? 6 from Wizard, plus basically 3 from Eldritch Knight, meaning we are a ninth level caster now, for spell slot purposes. And that's fantastic, as it means our Shadowblade could do 4d8 per hit. For the record, even if you had a Flame Tongue Rapier, Using concentration for haste now and getting that fourth attack would still mean less damage than making three attacks with a 4d8 shadow blade, especially if using shadow blade would give you advantage that you otherwise wouldn't have. Of course, you might have a different magic weapon, say like a plus three rapier or something. At that point, it gets a little more tricky. A plus three rapier would take the lead at like higher enemy armor classes, for example, but that's also going to be impacted by whether or not you had advantage with that rapier, or if you would have had advantage, were you using Shadow Blade? I definitely don't have time to go through each magic rapier and do like a side by side comparison to like using that magic weapon with four attacks versus Shadow Blade with three, but you guys fortunately can use the exact same calculator that i do to check the damage yourself it's a great tool i link to it in every video description it's a, a dpr calculator done by ludic savant shout out to him so yeah play around with it i'm gonna assume that we're sticking with shadow blade at level 16 we would be a fighter 10 and we get the eldritch strike feature from eldritch knights so this tells us that when you hit an enemy with an attack it has disadvantage on a saving throw against a spell you cast against it until the end of your next turn. I just kind of have a hard time imagining that we're going to use this all that often. I mean, we can cast a cantrip when we take the attack action that doesn't have to be green flame blade, like I've said, but like Toll the Dead would do 3d12 at this level if they failed their wisdom save, but I would rather have a 4d8 shadow blade plus a 2d8 from green flame blade plus five from dexterity than 3d12, right? The place I see this maybe getting used is if you wanted to say, use all of your weapon attacks and you hit three different enemies, right? And then you action surge and throw out, say, hypnotic pattern because you want to put a powerful control spell down and now all three of them that you hit because there's no limit to how many enemies you can impact with Eldritch Strike. So all three of them would have disadvantage on that Hypnotic Pattern spell, or Fireball, or, you know, whatever else that you might be casting. I mean, you could also, I suppose, like, take your two attacks, Action Surge, use Hold Person, and now they have disadvantage, right? And then you get at least a bonus action still, attack to make a weapon attack against that enemy. You probably would have done more damage if you're going to action surge, make weapon attacks, but the rest of your team is going to benefit from them being held also. Not only can the enemy not do things, but attacks against them have advantage for everybody. Your melee allies are going to auto crit, etc. Anyway, you guys let me know what you think the best use for Eldritch Smite is in the comment section. I'd love to hear your thoughts. There's probably something that I'm not thinking about. But then, finally, for us, at level 17, we are a Fighter 11 and we have reached the promised land. Because fighters at level 11 get extra, extra attack, right? Now we get to make three attacks when we take the attack action. One of which can be a cantrip, thanks to Bladesinger. And when we use our action to cast a cantrip, we get a fourth attack as a bonus action for four Shadow Blade attacks. One of which is made with a Green Flame Blade Rider that does an additional 3d8 of damage at this level, at level 17. So now you could action surge for seven attacks, two of which get the green flame blade rider. Sweet. For our final damage report then, 
Again, I'm assuming advantage on our attacks, thanks to Dim Light or Darkness, we're using a 4d8 Shadow Blade for all four of our attacks, plus Green Flame Blade for one of them. Adjust accordingly, if need be. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would be doing 114 damage per round on average, and against an enemy with an 18 armor class, it would be 106 DPR on average. We have broken the century barrier for sustained damage. And even against an enemy AC of 18, we've kind of crept up into the middle of the pack compared to other T1 sustained damage builds now. And we are strutting with our Blade Master. And we're probably harder to hit, by the way, than any of those other T1 sustained DPR builds. So let's sum up with final thoughts. The final tier score for this character is a 59, putting it in the bottom half of all tier one builds at the time of this recording, anyway. I'm impressed. I love the way this character just kept getting better and better compared to the competition as they leveled. And honestly, even if you're only playing this character until level eight or 10 or 12, they're still going to be a really strong and viable character and fun character to play. Now, keep in mind that those other sustained DPR builds that I have been comparing this to, right? They were all intentionally built to do solid sustained DPR, right? So even if you're kind of in the bottom half of tier two sustained DPR builds, you're still doing really well. But more important than that for me is the way that this character really lets me feel like an awesome Gish spell sword blade master. They might not do quite as much damage as the pure blade singer, I'll admit, but they also just play purely with two weapons their entire career. Maybe just a little bit more of a true martial character who is augmented by their spells than even the Bladesinger alone can be, who starts to rely less on their weapons and more on things like animate objects and summon creatures and things like that as they level up. Plus, the additional defense you bring here with the fighter levels, the dual wielder feet, just made it feel that much more fun, I think. You are going to be almost impossible to pin down and will bring really solid damage and a ton of control and utility to the fight as well when you need it. It is a gish's gish. And so, that's the build for the week. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed creating it. I can't wait to play it and hope to do so, at least in a one-shot or something sometime soon. Who knows, this might become a, a longer-term character for me in a future uh, longer campaign. But I love you guys. I think you're fantastic. I'm so grateful for all of your support. And um, please do check out the other content in the channel. Please like and subscribe and consider joining the channel as a member if you really want to go the extra mile to support us and get a little write-up for each episode that gives you kind of a step-by-step -step guide for how to recreate the character in-game if you wanted to. But regardless, I hope you have a fantastic day. I hope to see you again really soon. And until then, take care. Bye. Hashtag fighter world problems. <laughs> Mute. That's going to come in. That's going to, that's going <laughs> to drink of water. Mm. Uh, consider scratch. We can cause that flame to, we, we can, we can, we can cause. <laughs> Where was I? Where was I? Also 2d8 damage. Plus our, uh oh, intelligence modifier, Ooh, proficiency bonus. That's too much. That's too much. I don't want to. Yeah, that's too much. So anyway, thanks for coming to my TED talk on the, on the best sustained damage level one character. <laughs> Can I cross that off my to do list now? I'm crossing it off my list.